Hello, I'm Mimi Libelle, founder of Vespod and author of Your Broke, Your Pre Rich. Welcome to The Wallet, our new seven episode mini series where we take your most pressing questions to financial advisors for the love of money. In this episode, we delve into the often complex and emotionally charged subject of money in relationships. Joining me is financial planner Abigail Banks, who shares valuable insights on effectively managing joint finances, communicating about money, and aligning financial goals with relationship goals. Tune in as we discuss the financial implications of being single and what to do if you're dating someone, important considerations before getting married, maximizing tax benefits, navigating divorce, and more. Additionally, we address the issue of one partner exerting control over the other through money. I'm often asked, how do I find a mortgage broker, financial advisor, or an accountant I can trust? In a world full of chaos and noise, it can definitely be tricky to know where to turn. This is where Unbiased comes in. Unbiased is a matching service that helps to connect you with the most experienced and regulated experts. Essentially, they do the work of finding the right expert person for you. And the best bit? It's free to use. Visit unbiased.co.uk today and find your match made in money heaven. Remember that we are not certified financial advisors. Information shared in this podcast is for educational purposes only and does not constitute financial advice. Hi, my name is Veronica and I'm divorced. Um, I was wondering what are the sort of checklist of things to look out for uh, when you are getting divorced and how do you navigate, I guess, a lack of maybe perhaps financial trust in a new relationship if you had previously bad experiences with your ex-partner. Thank you so much. As we know, it's quite tricky to talk about money. It's a very emotionally charged topic uh, in, in relationships and it's about managing joint finances. Should we have separate accounts, aligning financial goals with like relationship goals, difference in income? So a lot to, uh, to unpack today. But maybe I'll start with my first question. So we, <laughs> we, go, uh, we go straight in is how can couple effectively manage their joint finances while also maintaining their independence and individual financial goals? For me, that's like super important. Really important. And for me, I think everyone's so independent, you know, when you come into a relationship. So it's really hard to adjust to being with somebody and then, you know, identifying what's important to you both. So I think it's um, a really easy start is, you know, if you're living together, for example, you know, looking at your joint expenditure. So, you know, the really mundane stuff, you know, council tax, um, bills, food. And, you know, I think a really good thing to do is set up a joint bank account just for your, you know, core expenditure on a joint um, basis. And you can both pay in a monthly budget to that. You know, it doesn't need to be 50-50. I think if one person does earn significantly more than the other, you can absolutely discuss, you know, should we have a different split just to reflect how much we are both bringing into the the household. So 60, 40, 70, 30, whatever works for you both. Um, And it just allows you to both have an oversight of that joint expenditure, get used to budgeting from a household point of view. But then the remainder of your money is really there in your personal bank account for you to enjoy and and do what you want with. And I think it's a great way to then start those conversations about goals-based planning. So what are your short medium long-term objectives you know if we want to buy a house in the short term what do we both need to start saving together and it's having that oversight of each other's finances but also maintaining your independence which is so important to many people yeah no it's quite it's quite nice to to have both um and and also as you said like deciding how much money do you actually put into the common pot uh, probably based on your income i always think it's you know quite a good idea to uh, to to do that but having this first conversation um and how important is it for couple to put money in their pensions um and what are some of the you know potential benefits of doing so yeah, so pensions are um, really fantastic. You know, they have so many great tax benefits associated with them. Um, 
the really obvious one is uh, you receive income tax relief on all personal contributions that you make into a pension. So as an example, if you put £80 into a pension, the government will give you £20 directly into your pension. So it grosses up your contribution to £100. Um, now, if you are a higher rate or an additional rate taxpayer, you can claim back any additional tax relief on your self-assessment tax return. And any growth in that pension fund whilst it's in there is completely free of income tax and capital gains tax. So very, very tax efficient. There is a trade off. You know, it's very tax efficient, but you will not be able to access your pension until minimum pension age, which is actually increasing to 57 from 2028. So you need to be really comfortable that you're locking this money away for your long term future. If you do need that in the short term, so, you know, if you are trying to buy a house together, for example, it may be that you decide, well, I actually need access to some of this surplus income in the short term. So it may not be the right thing to lock it away at at this point in time. Now, most employers do offer a workplace pension. They have to under auto enrolment rules, which came in a number of years ago, and they will make contributions into that Um, scheme for you which is just an additional benefit for you so I always think it's a really great idea as a minimum to be part of your workplace pension scheme just to start that building um, of savings for your future. A conversation I had early on uh, with my partner was you know if there's a differential in income or if if, for example one you know I had um, my children and I, I took some breaks from work so I didn't get to actually contribute into my pension um, my partner actually contributed into into my pension, and that's something a lot of people don't actually know about. And maybe it's it's also again like a difficult conversation to have, but it's it's a massive benefit, I think, to also help bridge the you know the the, the wealth gaps, and 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 I think especially for for women. Oh, I completely agree, and I, I mean I have to say that you know I do um, sadly come across quite a lot of clients um, who are going through divorces or you know breakdowns, and quite often you know it is the the woman who takes time out of work to look after the children, and that their pension benefits you know do suffer as a result of that. So I think it's fantastic that you know really your your husband did that because it's really uncommon. Um, even if you're not working, you still have uh, an allowance to put into your pension. So you can put up to £3,600 gross yep. each tax share. It will only cost your partner £2,880 to do that because you'll get the tax relief. So I think it is um, looking at your, your household income and recognising the roles that you're taking on in the relationship. So one person is you know, earning I'm bringing that in, but you are spending your time raising children. You're both contributing to the household just in different ways. And then I I think it's trying to equalise, you know, the income really and using your tax allowances efficiently efficiently as well. Yeah, I love that. And I think it's it's seeing working on your personal finances and doing it as a, as a team, because often you tend to do it in silos. So I manage my finances, you manage my finances, we're on different level of income, maybe we have this common pot. But I think it's thinking like beyond in terms of, you know, estate, the assets you're building, can you actually help each other? Because if one of you is very poor in retirement, that's not going to help you, you know, you or your relationship anyway. So I think it's, you know, starting to have this conversation very early on. Completely. I mean, the retirement point is a really interesting one. So, you know, if you get to, you're both, you know, turn 57 and one person has all of the, the assets in their name, you come from a purely kind of unemotional point of view. You know, you've got one person with loads of tax allowances that you can't utilise because you don't have any assets in their name. Yeah. So really, it, it's it's utilising these to make it as tax efficient as possible, both now, but also when the future, when you come to draw down from the money that you've built up. We've been reading a lot of articles recently about the cost of being single. So I'd like to talk about that and also talk about if then you, you know, start, you're in a relationship, you're thinking about, uh, you know, getting married. So what are the things to to actually uh, think about and, you know, this transition? Yeah, so being single, um, you know, it, it it is more expensive. I was thinking about this earlier and, you know, naturally there are a lot of expenses in life that are fixed, particularly when it comes to, um, you know, a household. So if you have rent, that is fixed, whether you're single or in a relationship, um, same with a, you know, a mortgage. So, you know, it is more expensive, I think, to, to be single than, than in a, um, a relationship or a marriage, 
Mortgages are a really interesting one, actually, because, you know, particularly multiples of salary. If you're a single, you can borrow less. And if you're with somebody trying to buy a property and that will impact, you know, ultimately the type of property that you can buy. Um, and there are a lot of, you know, benefits of of being married. Um, you know, it's marriage can be very good tax planning, you know, taking the romantic side out of it. Yeah. Um, there are a lot of benefits being married. You know, an example is... Um, uh, transfers between spouses during lifetime and on death are free from inheritance tax so you don't have to worry about uh, you know any inheritance tax if you are, are married um, and as well things like assets that may have capital gains attached to them if you transfer that to a spouse that's a lower taxpayer than you there isn't any um, kind of disposal of an asset when you transfer between spouses so you don't realize that gain and then that's that um, the spouse the lower tax band can encash that assets and the tax is charged at a lower rate so there is much more tax planning opportunities when when somebody's married versus you know being a married couple what are some of the key financial considerations for couples who are planning to get married on top of budgeting a very expensive wedding <laughs> absolutely i know i'm doing that at the moment <laughs> i have to say um, <laughs> Firstly, coming back to our, our first episode, uh, you know, um, wills and legal planning is really important. So if, if you both have wills in place, um, they may be really old or you did them together. If they weren't made in anticipation of marriage, they will be revoked on marriage. So it's really important to review your wills um, and, you know, perhaps change them anyway, because, yeah, you know, life will be changing post-marriage, I imagine. Um also considering, you know, prenuptial agreements. Um, I was speaking to a family lawyer and, you know, I think they do have some negative connotations attached to them, but they can be really beneficial in the right circumstances. And really they're there to protect both spouses in the event of a breakdown of marriage. So it's something to, to consider and perhaps have a, a, a discussion about if you think it might be appropriate um, with your future spouse. Pension nominations, so review and change those to your your new spouse if you haven't done so already. You know, often I find it's siblings or parents on there that the clients put in, you know, 20 years ago. So yeah. just updating those, I think it's really important. Yeah. And perhaps your death in service as well through work, if you have that, updating the nomination to your, your spouse, um, really important. And lastly, if one person, for example, bought a property and took out a mortgage on that property when they were single, they might not have taken any life cover to cover that mm -hmm. debt. But now their you know, situation has completely changed. So I think considering taking out life cover, so to protect the, you know, the new spouse so they can continue living in that property, um, you know, if there was, was something to happen. And now in the, of course, unfortunate, um, you know, event of um, a divorce, What are some of the financial, important like financial um, considerations to keep in mind? Because we've had like, you know, a, a few stories in, in, the, in the communities and women come to us with questions and you can feel particularly lost at this point in time, especially if you feel your partner has more assets than you, that you don't have mm -hmm. access to legal advice. You're sometimes rushed into taking decisions. But what are the, the sort of the first things to, to do? I think with the, the no-fault divorce rules that came into effect this year, it should hopefully be easier and less contentious for couples to apply for a divorce because you're not going there trying to prove a fault or a wrongdoing. You know, it hopefully will come less contentious at the start. But I always really recommend that um, both parties seek a legal advice from a family lawyer. That can be invaluable. Um, It, they are really helpful in looking at the different options and also how to divide the assets fairly and in the best interest of, you know, the client that they're representing. Um, I really think, you know, you've, you've got to look at all of the assets as a whole and get a fair settlement for each spouse and recognise what they have brought to the relationship, you know, going back to, you know, if a, a woman has children and takes time out of work, It's, she may not have financially contributed to the household, but she contributed in different ways by bringing up the children, which in itself, I think, is very valuable. So hard to value, so hard to, you know, yeah, share. It's so hard to value. Um, 
Exactly. So I think income and earning capacity is really, really important to consider. And, you know, if one spouse is going to be the main caregiver, you know, they do not have the same ability to go out and earn in the same capacity as the, the, you know, the other party. So it's having a really open discussion with, you know, your lawyer looking at all of the assets that are available, both, you know, joint and individual assets, and then the future, you know, earning potential and ultimately what what you need to live a good life and then you can go back and you know present what you think is a fair settlement and just one other tricky topic when we talk about money and relationship is is debt so we have a, a full episode about debt and we're going to talk about that but what is the best way to approach debt if one or both uh, people have like financial burdens Yeah, so um, debt is, um, it depends what type of debt it is, I'd say, you know, a mortgage is very common and, and very standard. I think if someone has, um, you know, debt or serious money problems, it, it's very, very difficult. Um, they may not have disclosed that, you know, when you first started um, dating. So it's really, I think, trying to make them aware of you know how did, how did they end up in debt understanding that and then helping them to to you know get to a point where that debt is cleared it may be that they need some kind of um counseling money counseling alongside that or you help them with their budgeting but i think it's just trying to have an open and honest no judgment discussion um and then getting to a point where you can help you know your partner through that yeah and i think you know these these conversations i mean They're quite important, I guess, to, to have because we all have like a different level of financial education. So we were brought like a different way. We may have different beliefs about money. Is it something you do also with your with your clients when you advise uh, couples? Yes, I think it's so incredibly important to discuss the emotional side of money. It can provide you with, you know, real insight into why you know, that person might react a certain way or have certain views. You know, for example, I've got a client um, when she was growing up, her family had serious money problems and there was points where, you know, they, they didn't have any money at all. And now she is incredibly risk averse. You know, she risk to her is she doesn't want to consider it. You know, financial security is everything to her. And I think it's, if we didn't know the background of that, we wouldn't fully appreciate um, why she was reacting so, you know, strongly to even, you know, discussing investment risk. Um, so you can really understand the anxiety some people have about money and understand what is driving their viewpoints and then hopefully, you know, help them through that. What are some make it or break it compromises when it comes to relationship? <laughs> are most issues um, actually workable? Oh, it's such a good question. I was, <laughs> um, so I really think you, you do need to be on the same page broadly when it comes to you know financial objectives and approach. I think if you are incredibly different, then it's probably um, going to be difficult to have a, you know, a joint <laughs> financial journey together. So um, I honestly think if someone, you know, for example, if somebody wants to take out, you know, a million pound mortgage to buy a house and the other person doesn't feel comfortable at all about that, it is going to cause, you know, major strains on your, your relationship. So I think, again, having those conversations early, you know, how do you feel about certain um, types of, you know, finances, what, what is driving those emotions will hopefully get you on the same page to then move forward together. Yeah, I think it's also making a few compromises and uh, lowering your expectations sometimes and uh, having these conversations. And I think just respecting why, um, if, if it's an absolute no-go for somebody, you know, you've got, you've got to respect that um, because it, you don't want to push somebody down a, a route that they also may feel really uncomfortable with. Yeah. And yeah. I, I have seen that, you know, not so much with clients that look after, but perhaps once they've left a relationship, for example, and they start opening up, there's been scenarios where they didn't fully understand what was going on or felt feel comfortable with, you know, the, the finances. Um, uh, so, it, yeah, I think getting on the same page at the start is incredibly important. Yeah. Um, and finally, what are three questions uh, you ask your partner about finances uh, before settling down for, for life together, for marriage or whatever, you know, whatever journey you're on? 
Yeah, so I think um, first one, which is not so happy, I think, you know, do they have debt or serious money problems? I think that's really important to, to understand before it, you know, particularly merging finances together and potentially liabilities, just understanding a bit more about that. Um, and then some perhaps happier questions so you know what does a good future look like together ultimately what are some objectives they're trying to achieve and how can you both do that and I think you know do they want to start a family together I think children is a really important conversation to Mm -hmm. have because that will you know determine things like you know where do we buy property for a catchment area for example how much do we need to save to to do that um private school fees for example so it just allows you to understand where you're both at with these topics and then hopefully make some good decisions together. And Abby, something we, we also discussed in, in the community and we recorded like a, a, an episode, a, a podcast episode about it is is financial abuse or when one of the partner in the relationship is controlling, maybe because they have more money than the other. I mean, how do we sort of recognize that? Because sometimes you're actually in this situation, but you don't you don't know, you don't recognize it if you don't have someone telling you, you know, that's not normal. Um, and how maybe to to recognize it in in other people and how how you can help because di- I, I guess this can escalate quite quite quickly and these are very tricky situations to to deal with. Very tricky. And I, I think unfortunately as well, like, you know, it's mostly women that, that suffer um financial abuse and control. Not always, but it's it's very common just because of the power dynamics. And I think staying at home as well, looking after children, perhaps you kind of isolate you're isolated as well. Um so it financial abuse is, is it can be quite tricky to identify, I think, but you know, key drivers if someone has a really strict, you know, allowance, for example, um, you know, if they only have a certain amount of money and that's being controlled by their partner not because that's what they earn you know they're getting allowance I think that's a real real sign um I also think not having oversight of the finances so not understanding perhaps Mm -hmm. you know where money is held in different bank accounts what their partner earns you know lack of information is ultimately somebody trying to control you know the other person um and it's really hard, I think, trying trying to help someone, but maybe trying just to have an open discussion with them about, you know, well, you know, that's, are you comfortable with that? You know, that's not how it works in, in my relationship. Is that something um, you feel comfortable with? Do you know, would you like to talk about it? And just slowly giving them the confidence perhaps to, to discuss it. But equally, if there's other factors going on, you just need to be really careful that you're not putting them in a, in a position where they could be um, put in danger, really, I think. There was helplines as well. So, you know, confidential helplines that people can call. So if you do think somebody is in a position like that, giving them perhaps, you know, the means to talk about it with someone who's impartial, I think is really important as well. Yeah. And I feel something I've seen is like, there's definitely a spectrum. And of course, you know, financial advice, you know, it's, it's really hard, it's really tricky situation. But I've seen things that are, sort of in the middle where maybe the partner who earns more is controlling a little bit the money is also maybe, you know, I say he, but it can be he or she, but like controlling maybe the investments and the other partner starts asking questions. They're like, yeah, don't worry. It's not like bullying or something in a relationship, but they just want to avoid the others to be involved in the conversation. And I think for women, it's really important to go especially if your partner is managing investments on behalf of everyone, just try to understand the level of risk they're taking with their investment. Is that something 100%. that you, you actually see? Absolutely. So I think when I, particularly when I work with um, my clients, I always make sure that both parties are in the room, particularly for the starting discussions. It's absolutely fine for someone to take the lead, you know, or particularly on the, you know, admin side or whatever. But I think for really, really important discussions, particularly around, investment risks um you know objectives now ultimately what the money is for both parties need to be in the room and it is that financial education piece you know if someone isn't comfortable with financial terms or concepts and they're not even able to be in the room to start learning it how are they ever going to start challenging someone if they do feel that they're not um you know being involved or you purposefully being excluded so yeah I think it's so important to be involved in the conversations and um, knowledge is, is everything really thank you so much Abby
Thank you for tuning in to this episode of The Wallet. We recognize that discussing money can sometimes be seen as taboo, and we believe in the power of sharing knowledge with friends as a meaningful way to give back. Make sure to click and follow The Wallet on your preferred podcast platform so you won't miss episode 3, launching next Thursday, about debt, the good, the bad, and the ugly. If you enjoyed our show, we would greatly appreciate your support by leaving a 5-star rating on Apple Podcasts. Lastly, make sure you mark your calendars for upcoming live webinar on financial advice on July 20th, where we'll explore the ins and outs of working with a trusted advisor. You can sign up for free via the show notes or on Vespa.com.